Welcome back to Comedian MTG. My name is Ian. On today's episode, I'm going to be breaking down my top four run uh, to SCG Philly. Now, normally with things like this, I sometimes do a tournament breakdown. Sometimes I'll do a top 16 deck list. Uh, unfortunately, the way this worked was like half of the deck lists were on command tower and half of them were not on command tower. So kind of hard to do a top 16 breakdown of this tournament. But what I do have is a bunch of notes from my tournament. Uh, and how I took this pretty spicy deck. I mean, this was literally the uh, the weekend of Fallout's release. It was the storm is on three nine twenty four, and uh, Fallout officially released three eight twenty four. So I brought this brand new Fallout Commander to the top four of a hundred and twenty two person tournament. So I'm gonna tell you all how I uh, how I did it. But before we jump into any of that, reminder, while you're here on YouTube, hit that like button, that subscribe button, comment down below if you are curious about some of the things in today's episode. All of that stuff is completely free and it helps out the channel a ton. Also, if you're interested, check out patreon.com slash comedian MTG, where you can have a number of different perks, including our coaching tier, which is something we'll be talking about a little bit further in the episode. But you get things like your name, in the credits, stuff like that. I do have to go through and revamp a bunch of stuff in there. We've had event after event after event after moving to this new place. So I haven't really had time to dive super deep into the Patreon, but it's definitely high on my priority list. It's just there's a lot of stuff happening right now. But without any further ado, let's jump in. As many of you know, I uh, did break down this very commander on this channel and did sort of like a live brew two weeks ago. Uh, and this deck that I have here today is actually quite different from the deck that I live brewed for the channel. I had sort of a rough idea with that version of the deck. Um, but one of the biggest downsides I found out between now and then was that the Master Transcendent doesn't really work well with Hermit Druid, right? So. Hermit Druid was one of the things I was most excited about for this commander, and unfortunately, the way Hermit Druid works is you actually reveal a number of cards uh, from your deck until you hit a basic, and then you put them into your graveyard. You don't mill those cards, right? So the master doesn't see those cards being milled, and therefore you can't use its second ability, uh, which we'll highlight in a second, to put Hermit Druid or put the Thassa's Oracle onto the battlefield. So uh, speaking of the master, let's actually read our commander before we jump into this. As I mentioned, we did a deck tech on this channel, but it's quite different. So I'm definitely going to highlight a lot of those differences here. So the master says whenever it enters the battlefield and a player gets two rad counters, for those who don't row rad counters, they check at the beginning of your main phase and they say, OK, for every rad counter, you mill a card and for every non land there, you lose a rad counter and you take that much damage. Right. So basically, the idea is if you give your opponent infinite rad counters, they are going to mill through their entire deck and take damage equal to the number of non-lands, which 99.999% of the time kills the opponent. Um, worst case scenario, sometimes it will leave them with some amount of life if for some reason they've deep consulted and they have like three cards in the deck, but it will mill their entire deck. So they don't die that turn, which is a bit awkward sometimes. Um, there's very, very niche scenarios where this actually comes up, but sometimes they will get a turn to try and win which is usually not great. And it didn't come up during this tournament, but it was definitely something I was very anxious of for sure. Um, and that's definitely one of the downsides that we'll illustrate about this deck. But the idea is definitely you want to get infinite rad counters on your opponents. You also kind of can do some funky stuff with that second ability, which we'll definitely be talking about. But between my original deck tech and now, uh, the deck that I brought to this top four, there were a number of changes. So we have 20 cards different from that original version of this list. Um, and they're pretty significant. So in, in my current version, uh, we have the Basalt and Mesmeric Orb combo. We have things like Blood Chief Ascension. We have one of the new cards from uh, our commander deck here for the mutant deck, Rawl Troubleshooter. Um, so there's definitely a bunch of stuff here. We can talk about the additions, but what are the, what are the things we took out? So obviously we took out Hermit Druid, right? Um, we took out the cards that work with Hermit Druid, which I don't think we were actually playing in the earliest version. So I actually, as, as you can observe, uh, the original name of the my deck list for SCG Philly is called Mutant 4.0, right? So I've gone through a number of different iterations with this deck, right? So uh, no Hermit Druid in the deck, no Dread Return, right? So the only way to get things out of the graveyard is through our commander's ability, right? So we got rid of a lot of the clunky stuff uh, that wasn't really working out. I spent an entire week just like retooling the deck, doing a bunch of goal fishing with it, retooling the deck, doing a bunch of goal fishing with it, with, and just like trying to get the numbers to a point where I wasn't losing my mind. And it took a while. I'm not going to lie. I went through, as I mentioned, four different completely distinct versions of the deck, not to mention how many micro changes I made uh, between now and then. Right. So 
The only infinite mill combo remaining in this new version of the deck for infinitely milling ourselves is Basalt plus Mesmeric Orb. And the reason I was okay with just that one combo was that Mesmeric Orb by itself is good enough with our commander that I don't really care if Basalt Monolith is kind of a dead card a lot of the time. And yeah, you need your commander out for these things, right? But like the whole point of playing this commander specifically is that you get sort of this value reanimation plan. So you'll see with like cards like Mesmeric Orb and Mind Crank, those are the ones where it's like, OK, that's when our, our commander becomes our game plan, right? Like that's like the grind engine with this deck is having your commander out and then getting some of these like juicy reanimator targets as well, as long as like also just like, you know, sniping Docksides out of your opponent's decks and stuff like that, right? So as I mentioned, there's some juicy reanimation targets here. We have Hoarding Broodlord, which we do have a saw in half combo for. It's not like an explicit saw in half combo, but the idea is that Hoarding Broodlord comes out. You need two in a green because you saw in half Hoarding Broodlord, making one Broodlord lord and um it, or making two brew lords right they're both four fours and then you the two cards you get are your eternal scourge food chain you play the food chain by tapping both brood lords right so that's two colorless reduced from this cost uh meaning it only costs green right so you need the tapping the first brood lord to help cast the saw in half meaning that only costs two generic mana and then the two taps allow you to cast food chain for a single green right you exile a copy of the brood lord which makes you nine whatever mana doesn't matter eternal scourge is a colorless card and then you play eternal scourge and do the food chain combo player commander win the game right so that's the saw and half line we'll talk about this a little bit more as things go on but i never used any of the reanimation targets for this deck so that might be a game plan that needs more testing more time i don't know if it like those things didn't come up naturally or if those things didn't come up because that's just not gonna be a viable angle for this deck, right? And as I mentioned, as we go through the rounds of this tournament, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But like, that's one of my concerns with this deck moving forward is like, does the reanimation stuff actually matter at all? Or is this just, maybe we're underestimating how good Kasuro Kima is in the current metagame, right? Yeah, we definitely do have like that minor reanimation package here, right? So we have we have our four reanimation targets, like the two value ones of Neza Hall, Consecrated Sphinx, and then Razaketh and Hoarding Brutal are trying to be more definitive reanimation targets pretty, pretty fairly, right? Um, we also have uh, Brain Freeze here, which once again is another one of those cards that is actually really good with our commander by itself, right? So you you already kind of want to be uh, milling a bunch of cards. You're, you know, the storm count goes crazy on one turn, whatever happens, right? You mill yourself for 30 and then you're like, oh, cool, my, my Razgath hit the graveyard. I'm going to tap my commander. Boop. Now he's a 3-3 on the battlefield and I have a Razgath, right? That's kind of the idea with Brain Freeze. It's definitely one of the cheekier cards in the deck, but it like works really well with what the deck's trying to do. And then Predator's Grasp, which I was already playing Brain Freeze, so I and I was already playing Lion's Eye Diamond for the uh, for the loops with Razaketh, right? And so I was like, you know, <laughs> I can play Predator's Grasp, and there is a world uh, in which I Predator's Grasp someone else's Underworld Breach. It almost came up once, but I had a better line. But man, I was so tempted <laughs> in that game to go for the Praetors Grasping Someone's Breach because I had Brain Freeze in hand. I had LED in the graveyard and I was like, oh, come on, I can go for it. But there was like a much cleaner Mnemonic Betrayal line. I was like, all right, fine. Um, but that's one of the, the spicy includes of the deck. It's, it's kind of funny. We, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Mesmeric Orb also, we'll talk about it, came in clutch. Uh, Blood Chief Ascension, I think, is just solid in the meta right now. Also is a combo with Mind Crank. N never saw it in the course of the tournament. One of the additions between now and then was Spellseeker, and my goodness, Spellseeker was one of the MVPs, like absolutely MVP of this deck, would not cut it. Uh, so, so good. Uh, Raul was in there because I want another grind engine, right, with your commander. Uh, you kind of get this like one, two, and this came up in my semifinals match. Raul was there, didn't do like a super ton of stuff, but like definitely was not inconsequential, right? But the idea is like you play a Rowl, you mill a couple cards. Uh, if you mill a creature, you can tap your commander, bring it onto the battlefield. Um, or if you just have Rowl by itself, you're just like milling everybody a little bit and then like trying to get a bit of value. Uh, so, so I didn't hate Rowl in the deck. I once again only saw it in the semis, but it, it put in a decent amount of work. It was a decent grind engine, but not exceptional by any means, but I didn't hate it for sure. Yeah, we cut Hullbreaker Horror in the deck because we realized we weren't, we weren't that mid rangey, you know? Um, I could see us going back into it, but one of the things you'll notice from some of these cuts was that we did cut a decent amount of artifacts from the original version of the deck um and we were like really not a big mox opal deck as it was to begin with so it didn't really make a lot of sense for us to overcommit to this artifact plan and when you have a like not a ton of artifacts to bounce with holebreaker horror the combo becomes just infinitely worse in general right 
yeah, as I mentioned, we cut treasure turn. That's kind of like a lot of these like Hermitrid synergy pieces we got rid of. Flesh duplicate. I wanted Fimage in its place because specifically I wanted to be able to cast it a little bit easier and, and not really worry about the double blue cost uh, with a three color deck that like kind of got a little greedy at times. Um, and then like Lightning Greaves was mostly there for the Cephalid combo, which we did cut, right? So that's a lot of the differences between the two versions of the list. The other stuff, like there was a Transmute Artifact for both the Citadel line. I was just finding when I was gold fishing the deck, when I drew Citadel, I hated it because like I never wanted to actually do that. And then by the time there were, there were very few games where I wanted to jam my commander super early anyways. And then the presence of Transmute Artifact didn't really change that dynamic a ton for me. So. That's kind of why that didn't make the final cut. And yeah, that's kind of the differences between the deck and the version that I took to SCG Philly. I'm also happy to post version one, two, and three, sorry, one, two, three, and four uh, in the description of the video if people are curious about that. Um, if I don't end up doing that, please make a comment down below so that I remember to do that. But I think I should remember to do it, hopefully, uh, talking to Ian in the future. So this is the final list that I took to SCG Philly, right? So. Uh, for those who didn't watch the previous version of the video or who want more succinct description of what the what the wind lines are, right? Um, we'll talk about it. So we have Eternal Scourge and Mist Hollow Griffin here as payoffs for Food Chain, right? Uh, you can cast them infinitely with Food Chain. Food Chain was 90% of my wins with the deck. Uh, it's just the easiest, cleanest win in this list for sure. Um, I did try a couple cheeky Thoracle lines, but those did not pay off. <laughs> so Food Chain definitely the, the big win con for this deck in this tournament. A lot of the time, and this is kind of one of the problems I had playing this deck, was that like, once again, you know, a lot of the cheeky Master Transcendent stuff, I wasn't really seeing a ton of, and a lot of the generic good stuff Sultai cards like Talion and Ristic Study and the One Ring and, and Food Chain combos, like those were the things I was seeing throughout a lot of these games, right? So it's hard to judge whether the reanimation, the grindy sort of ratting yourself game plan is is super viable, right? Or, or like the thing we should be doing with the deck. I do think there are some inclusions in here that are strictly related to that. And I want to test the deck more like little things did come up like Mesmeric Orb ended up coming pretty key in one of these games. Once again, we'll talk about that in a minute. The other wing cons here are Thoracle and Console, right? As I mentioned, and then there's like Razgath lines where you can like get Razaketh, go get Eternal Witness, and do like the classic LED Eternal Witness stuff where you... Oh, actually, no, I didn't leave LED in this version of the deck. That's right. Uh, I, I didn't want to overcommit to Razaketh. There was a version of this deck with Lion's Eye Diamond in it. So the everything I said about Brain Freeze earlier, just swap out LED and put in Lotus Petal in instead. Um, but that's that's the rough idea of this deck. Um, you're trying to do some cheeky reanimation stuff sometimes, but 90% of the time you're doing Sultai good stuff. Uh, and yeah, let's talk about the rounds. And we gotta thank one of our sponsors for this video, Toa Magic, also known as Tales of Adventure. Toa is one of my favorite stores to attend at any live event. They always have insane selection, including foils. They have great shipping on their online store. They have a ton of things in stock, including for the CDH players. They got dual lands. They got a lot of that reserve list stuff in there. So they've got great inventory. You can check out toamagic.com. You can also use code comedian at checkout for a percentage off of your order. You're welcome. The link for that is in the description down below as always so if you have any questions about that you can jump down there but check out toa magic uh, great place to order cards great place to order singles it just just go check it out so i took as many notes as i could during this tournament it was a long day however i will note that star city made some big improvements from the last tournament they are now using command tower software for their pairings um so upside being you know a lot of the stuff is much easier to access they're not doing paper pairings anymore in 2024 uh they're using software designed for multiplayer all that good stuff uh downside is like the draw problem is still kind of a thing but there were a lot more people playing it out and i don't know if that was just how the tournament worked or something like that it was a little bit weird um but it you know it still was a five round one day tournament so uh, there were definitely pods that could draw into the top 16, but not a lot of them did. There were actually a lot of just like pods at the end playing it out. And I'm not really sure if that was just the way they were paired up or, or whatever. But round one, uh, we have myself in first. Uh, you're going to hear a lot of Kinnon this weekend. Uh, everyone I know was hearing about Kinnon playing against Kinnon. So we had Kinnon in second and fourth seat. And then in third seat, we had Liberator. And I believe the pilot is uh, one of the like, I mean, one of the only known Liberator pilots who like has done pretty well and, and is not accused of cheating. So uh, they were a pleasure to play against. Very polite, really sweet pod. 
Um, definitely some newer players in the pod. The two Canon players were, were definitely pretty new. Um, and one of the Canon players was definitely like playing a deck that was like clearly originally another commander. And like, it was a little bit interesting. And, and this happens sometimes with the Star Cities where like the early pods, uh, they like some people are playing a little bit worse cards than you would normally expect them to. Um, but usually they don't make it to the, the later rounds in the winning bracket. So the opener I had was a green black land and a mana vault, right? And then I straight up had the food chain combo in there, uh, had food chain plus Miss Holographin in it, right? And uh, a couple other cards that I don't really remember. Um, nothing like super crazy. I think it was like Wish Claw Talisman uh, and, and one other card. Uh, so like the hand wasn't bad. Looking back on it, it was probably a bit of a greedy keep. Um, I don't remember exactly how deep in the mulligan process I was, but I definitely like didn't expect to get as punished by this this keep as as I was. Uh, so basically, everyone's sort of doing the developing the mana value engine stuff or the, the mana engine stuff. Liberator gets out to a pretty quick start. They get like Liberator out on turn one. Uh, they start playing a couple card draw engines and and they start like doing pretty pretty decently. Uh, as far as the early game acceleration is going, but then they hit a point where they start to fizzle a little bit. They're like sort of using their lands to draw cards and whatnot. The Hinnon in fourth seat plays a turn three Basalt Monolith with a Manifold Key backup. So they play Basalt Monolith, play Manifold Key, go tutor for their treasure vault. Um, but at that point, I believe they made a mistake and thought they'd already played their land for turn. So they go, oh, I have infinite mana of colorless and I can't do anything to filter. So they pass back, right? It's my turn. I still have that wish claw talisman that I mentioned from the opening hand, right? And so I tap my mana vault. Uh, and this is part of the reason why I can't go off for like the rest of the game. Uh, tap the mana vault to use the wish claw and I go get Mesmeric Orb. And this card ends up being the MVP of this game, right? Uh, I go get Mesmeric Orb, knowing that the Kinnon deck will have to try and do the infinite tap and untap through his Mesmeric Orb, right? And I also know that the Liberator deck is also trying to do the infinite tap untap stuff, right? Um, so I play Mesmeric Orb. Uh, in response, Liberator does some funky stuff, but they don't actually get anything. And I still pass the claw back to the Kinnon in second seat, right? And Kinnon is recognizing that there is like, you know, that they still have to get more stuff, right? Because we're not like out of the woods yet, right? Uh, Liberator does some crazy stuff where they start getting like a Forsaken Monument down. They play a couple things in response. Goes to player two Kinnon, right? Player two Kinnon tries to get a little greedy and goes, well, yeah, I'll get something with Wish Claw that'll deal with something, but I want to take an extra turn first. So they jam a Nexus of Fate. And player four, Kinnon, recognizes that they just said, well, on my next turn, I'm gonna get a little more value and then I'm gonna tutor up something that's gonna try and stop you, right? And meanwhile, you're wondering probably, why is there a Nexus of Fate in Kinnon? Uh, the player two, Kinnon, had mentioned at some point that they were a Tatiova player who had then heard Kinnon was a better deck and they tried to like half upgrade the deck, basically. So, so it was like half Kinnon, half old cards from Tatiova. It was a little bit strange. Um, but it was sort of like clearly like a building from the ground up type situation, right? Um, so they jam this Nexus Fate, try to take an extra turn. Kinnon in fourth seed just hits them with a dispel, right? So they're completely tapped out. They don't get to activate Wish Claw. They don't get to help us at all. Kind of sucks, right? Um, Liberator goes. They play a Forsaken Monument into a Sculpting Steel. Uh, I think it was on this turn. Forsaken Monument happened somewhere in between, but they hit the Sculpting Steel. So Sculpting Steel comes in as a copy of Basalt Monolith. Uh, for those who don't know, Forsaken Monument and Basalt Monolith is also an infinite colorless thing because you tap for four and untap for three, right? Once again, my Mesmeric Orb is still on the battlefield. So Liberator starts trying to go for it, right? They're netting a bunch of mana. They have like 10 colorless mana. Meanwhile, they're milling between every iteration. They're like, I think I can try and go for it here. Um, and we get to a point where I think I hit them with like a Mind Break Trap or something like that. Uh, and I like fizzle them through their win attempt, right? They still have technically infinite colorless on the battlefield uh, and they <laughs> also have like the way to go off with it, um, but without Mesmeric Orb, right? So they're in a weird place. Then they play a Phyrexian Revoker, stopping Kinnon, right? Or it's a Sorceress Spyglass, that's the card. Uh, so they look at my hand, they name Kinnon. Kinnons are shut off now. So now we go to Kinnon 4's turn. Kinnon in seat four, 
taps out to play a tide spout, doesn't have enough spells to make it work, right? Uh, and they just pass. <laughs> so they have a tide spout. We know that they have, you know, infinite colorless on their turn. If it gets back to them, they have the treasure vault as land, so they can filter it all, right? Uh, basically, it gets to the point where they need to go on their turn, go, okay, I'm going to bounce your basalt or mesmeric orb, and I'm going to bounce the Phyrexian Revoker that uh, our other player has, right? Um, or, or sorry, the Sorcerer Spyglass. I don't know why I keep calling it Phyrexian Revoker. The, the awkwardness is like with Liberator, even if they do bounce the Spyglass, they can just flash it back in in response, right? Um, but then you can put more activations on the stack and all that nonsense, right? So the timing wise is a little bit funky, but the, they know that's the pattern they have to go for, right? So we're recognizing the fact that, hey, if it gets back to Kinnon's turn on player seat four, he's going to tap with all of his mana, potentially an infinite mana combo, and have a tide spout to bounce the pieces that are stopping him, right? So I, I basically do nothing. I like I think I play a Sylvan Library at this point. Uh, and I go to pass the turn or, or some sort of card draw engine. Maybe it was Mystic Remora, something. It definitely wasn't a Remora. I have some sort of card draw. I don't remember what it is at this point. But I do that and I pass the turn. And then it goes to Kinnon 2. And we start talking about solutions, right? Um, and Kinnon 2 is like, well, let me look through my deck uh, and find an answer with the Swish Claw Talisman. I'll pass it right back to you so we can have the answer. Right? That, that was sort of the, the understanding was that he, I was in the absolute dog position of the table, right? It was getting absolutely trounced. Um, so they passed it back and then we were looking through their deck uh, for an answer for Forsaken Monument because we had a feeling Liberator was going to win on their turn and then it was going to go to the Tide Spout Kinnon, right? And as we're going through, we realize that he doesn't really have a lot of answers in the deck because as I mentioned, it's sort of like a, a, a deck where he's going to upgrade as he's going along, right? Um, he's going through his entire deck, doesn't really have an answer for Forsaken Monument, uh, and then goes... You know, we're, we're going through into the point where like we're collaborating so much. He like hands me a pile of his deck and I'm like, OK, we're, we all got to look through. And then I see Gilded Drake and I'm like, OK, well, if you take Gilded Drake, you can then start bouncing some Liberators board. You know, they can make infinite colorless in response if or, or, or a finite amount of colorless in response. They'll mill a bunch, but like in, enough to make it work. Right. Um, and yeah, that that part gets crazy. There's there's a lot of talk back and forth, but that player then takes the Tide Spout Tyrant. And then Kinnon 2 realizes they can make infinite colorless, but they can't make infinite colored mana. And they have a Thrasios in hand, but with only colorless mana. This game gets insane, for sure. Um, so they have infinite colorless mana with a Tide Spout that they just took from Kinnon 4. It's a whole thing. Um, basically, we pass around the table multiple times. Um, we get to the point where that player, right, uh, the Kinnon 2, I go, well, Liberator only has infinite colorless mana with Kinnon's Basalt Monolith, right? So why don't we just bounce Kinnon's Basalt Monolith and then bounce? I was like, if you have any other spell, you can then just proceed to bounce the Sculpting Steel. And even if it does flashback down in response, like it doesn't matter because the Basalt Monolith is already gone, right? So we do that. Uh, he casts a couple spells and basically ends at the point where it bounces Kinnon's Basalt Monolith, Kinnon Four's Basalt Monolith, and bounces uh, Liberator's uh, copy of Basalt Monolith, which then can, once again, no longer come back down to the Basalt Monolith. So he still has Tides Bound and Infinite Colors on his turn. We know he's going to win the turn after that. Um, it gets back to Liberator, and we're getting close to time in the round. This game is just a slog, right? Just just completely slugfest. And Liberator has been drawing cards through like their lands and a couple other things, and and uh, whatever the book is that came in those those pre-constructed brawl decks that you know gets Home of Legends, maybe? Yeah, it gets uh, counters every time your commander attacks or is enters the battlefield and stuff. So he's been slowly drawing and like we know he's like seconds away from popping off with something, right? Um, and at that final time in the round section, as I think we have like five minutes left, uh, Liberator hits Car Clan Ironworks, right? And once again, they milled a ton of cards into their graveyard, right? And we knew they had the Junk Diver in hand, right? So they play the Junk Driver, they sack it to the KCI, uh, and, and from that point, there's no more like tapping in any of these combos, right? So the Mesmeric Orb, it, well, untapping, I should say. The Mesmeric Orb is not triggering, and they assemble like a very complicated Car Clan Ironworks loop where they are able to recur uh, a bunch of spells over and over again and start drawing through their deck um, and eventually kill us with infinite colorless mana. So we do die to Liberator in round one. It was a lengthy round, but there was so much that happened. And that, that is a theme of today is that uh, 
is that there was a lot happening in these games. So uh, I do start the day 0-1, 0 wins, 1 loss, losing to Liberator in round 1. Pot number 2 was super interesting as well. We had Tevesh Ishai, uh, which was like the Humility Tevesh deck in seat 1. We had another Kinnon in seat 2. Uh, myself in seat three, and then a Maelstrom Wanderer deck in seat four. Once again, uh, definitely seemed like somebody who was just building up a casual deck and like was a little bit higher power than some other stuff that they had uh, clearly previously played, but like definitely not a super high power deck for sure. So during that game, I think I mulligan pretty low. Um, it was, yeah, I think I mulligan pretty low and I have a wish claw talisman in hand there was uh this is the most wish claws i think i've ever had in the game for sure um but i because see this is what happens because uh, i have an opportunity um to turn one demonic tutor and i can go grab a card advantage engine grab a turn two talion or <laughs> uh, i already have demonic consultation in hand so i can instead on turn two lead demonic consultation and then follow up with Thassa's Oracle, right? And I figure Maelstrom Wanderer is a big mana deck. Kinnon's going to tap out for its card advantage engines. I went for a line that I recognized was very greedy, but I was just in the mood to be a little cheeky this game for sure. So I get that down. Uh, demonic Tutor for Thoracle, which, by the way, rots in my hand for the entirety of this game. Spoiler alert. So I jam the consultation. Tveshi Shai taps your Hurricane Signet, hits me with a Fluster Storm. I, I recognize the error of my ways. I don't play the Thoracle, but what I do have in my hand is a Wish Claw, right? So I play the Wish Claw Talisman, um, and it goes around the turn cycle one time, uh, and I go to activate Wish Claw with a bunch of mana open, right? Giving it to the Maelstrom Wanderer player, right? So my thought process here was, I'm gonna go activate Wish Claw, go grab Opposition Agent, stop my opponents from winning, and then hopefully Maelstrom Wanderer is super greedy, wants to pump up a bunch of mana in their deck, they're gonna activate Go Get Dockside, I'm gonna snag it from them, and I'm gonna be able to do a couple things on my turn, right? Um, what ends up happening is, <laughs> uh, I was correct, Witch Claw Talisman, pass it, they go to activate, I flash in Oppo, I'm like, haha, no removal, I go to search their deck, and it's clearly like a mid to high power deck. <laughs> they don't have Dockside, they don't have literally anything I really want. Um, I take a Phyrexian Metamorph, which does come into play later, but I was like pretty bummed at this point. Um, meanwhile, Tveshi Shai just follows up that turn cycle by going, okay, cool, land, humility. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> so I have Thoracle in my hand that does nothing. I have uh, a Witch Claw Talisman, which originally was going to be passed back to me, but was not passed back to me because of the Humility. Makes sense. I understand. Uh, so I don't have a Witch Claw anymore. We get hit with the Humility. My Oppo gets shut off. Deveshi Shai very clearly starts being the problem, right? So we start like trying to devise any sort of idea for like how we can get out of this. The Maelstrom Wanderer player is like looking at a handful of creatures being like, I don't know what to do. They play like an Emoti at one point when they cascade into a ramp spell, right? So like they're not really doing a ton. Um, and then I look at Kinnon and I go, hey, here's the deal. If I make this Phyrexian Manamorph a Wish Claw and pass it to you, can you go get Besaidu and then pass it back? And I was like, I'm only going to send it to you if you will do those two things. And I was like, I can't go do that. I need you to do that. Uh, and they thought about it for a long time. We were really heavily falling behind Tevesh Shai. They had Tevesh out at this point, right? And for those who don't know, Tevesh makes 0-1 thralls, but under humility, uh, they're 1-1s, right? So even if you don't do like the card draw thing with Tevesh, they're still making 1-1s every turn. And you know, I'm not gonna like trade my opposition agent, which is currently a 1-1 under humility, uh, for a 1-1 thrall, right? So they're slowly getting out of the game, not to mention they have a bunch of card advantage, they're tutoring, they have a Mystic more for like several turns, right? Um, so Kinnan eventually agrees to work with me. Uh, I pass the claw to them, they activate the claw, pass it back, and they do not fire off the Besaidu, which I totally get, right? Because firing off the Besaidu on their turn after tapping out for claw, uh, like throws me the game basically, right? So like, I'm, I'm not pressed about that whatsoever. Um, the card I got with my claw was Tainted Pact, right? Because with this deck, you can be really aggressive with Demonic Constellation and Tainted Pact. You can exile a bunch of your deck, 
naming food chain, hopefully hit either your Mist Hollow or your Eternal Scourge, right? And then cast your commander over and over again with food chain, right? So I get a Tain Impact because it's basically a one card combo in my deck, right? I fire it off at the end step. I get pretty deep down into where I want to go. I put the food chain in my hand. Um, the turn after. I don't actually do this on this turn because I was being patient and I didn't want to reveal what I was trying to do. Um, but basically, it gets around the tire rotation of the table. I'm just holding up interaction. Same with Maelstrom. Uh, we do a little bit of attacking into Veshi Shy. Basically, it gets to the point where they fire off the Besaju in response to Deveshi Shy trying to Demonic Tutor, right? Um, because I have an oppo on board, right? And we want to be able to snag the tutor so Deveshi Shy can get out, out from underneath it, right? Deveshi Shy makes a very heads up play because they obviously can't interact with the Besaju with counter spells, so they counter their own Demonic Tutor so that I don't get it, which I'm like, yeah, makes sense. Like with Besaju gone, I'm in a very commanding spot. I still have a Wish Claw Talisman here, right? Um, Kinnon untaps, they have a couple mana engines going on. They're like all, they're very close to winning, right? Um, later, we found out that they were like planning on like copying my Wish Clop, which wasn't gonna work, but uh, they, they had some some machinations going on, but they just didn't have enough to actually be able to get there, right? So right now, I still have a Wish Claw with one counter on it. At end step, I fire off Tainted Pact, exiling my Enabler, like I had already talked about, uh, grabbing Food Chain. I activate Wish Claw on my turn, going and grabbing Pact as my backup. Uh, I already have a mental misstep in hand. I play the food chain. I use both of those counter spells to be able to save my win con. Uh, and luckily at that point, food chain resolves. Mist Holographin in graveyard. I'm able to exile uh, some of the creatures on my board, which I don't remember exactly what they were at the point, but exiled a bunch of creatures, played food chain infinitely, gave my opponents radiation counters, um, passed to each and every one of them. They did the whole, uh, let me see if I can try and win on my upkeep thing. Uh, that didn't happen and they got radiated out. A little bit of a crazy game for sure. Uh, Tevashi Shai was very much in the lead. We really had to do a lot of like, okay, pass this Wish Claw, pass this Wish Claw, pass this Wish Claw, pass this Wish Claw. Um, and yeah, it was a lot, of, a lot of craziness back and forth, a lot of working with the table, but uh, luckily I had exactly enough interaction at the end of the game to be able to get there through Tevashi Shai trying to answer me through their, their Mystic Remora, um, and it was able to get my food chain out. Three. Okay, so it is Obnixilis in first seat, right? Um, Thrasios Tevesh in seat two. Uh, Baby Blue Farm, also known as Bjornon Wurnog um, in seat three. Uh, and myself in seat four. Not a great place to be. Obnixilis is definitely like a heavier damage variant of Obnixilis. So a little bit less on the turbo now side, a little bit more on the like mid rangey but big slug. Part of Obnix list. Yeah, it was it was kind of crazy. Uh, this game was definitely a little bit of like value engines going back and forth. I had a turn two one ring with the ability to pay for a Ristic study, so that was pretty sick. Um, before it got to my second turn, the uh, Bjorn Wernog deck plays, also known as Clue Farm, Baby Blue Farm, whatever you want to call it. Uh, they play a Ristic study. And I'm looking at a Besager in my hand. I have mana up and I'm like, there's an Obnix list deck in here. Rakdos historically feeds the heck out of a Rhystic Study. It's also the deck I am most scared of in the pod with a lot of card draw, right? So like Thrasios Devesh is definitely like having a, a very grindy start. I think they mulligan out of like five or four or something like that. So it wasn't like a, a hyper worried about them. Uh, I was definitely respecting the, the player, but I definitely wasn't like really worried about them as much as Bjorn or Nog. Um, Ob was like having a decent start. They had had uh, the card out that pings you Molten Vortex, I want to say, uh, pings you one every upkeep. And then if you go to cast a free thing, you take five. So that was definitely a card that was defining this game, too. Um, but we'll, we'll get to that one later. So Bjorn of Wernog definitely is a deck that I'm I'm scared of when they get card advantage because it's like a little bit faster than Blue Farm. But the thing that can stop that deck is if you have pieces to dismantle it early on, right? So like if they don't get their Rhystic Studies, they don't have access to Timda and Krom, right? They don't have access to those consistent engines. So if you can stop their one or if you can stop their Rhystic Study, the deck doesn't do nearly as much and therefore it gets a lot less threatening. It's, it's like that weird place between Rogsai and Tevesh Krom and Blue Farm, right? It's got that, like it, it, it feels like the perfect middle of all of those decks. Um, so that deck, I, I hit the Rhystic Study and I feel really good about it. I mean, we did the math later and like the Rhystic would have drawn so many cards. Um, so I untap, play a one ring, feeling pretty okay about that. Um, then we, I think we go an entire turn cycle around 
and we're just sort of like people are playing engines, all that kind of stuff. Thrasios to Vesh is like Thrasios out with a couple of mana producers, all of that stuff. Um, then it goes to Ob Nixilis's turn after me, and Ob goes in order. Seething Song into Toxic Deluge X equals four. And I think I had like, uh, I don't remember if I had, I don't think I had any creatures on board at the time. Oh, I just played my commander. That's exactly what it was. So I played my commander and passed. So they were like, sure, I'm going to Deluge X equals four, wipe all of Thrasios's dorks, wipe Thrasios, and then Bjorn or Wernog had uh, some creatures on board. I can't remember exactly which ones they were, but all the creatures go away. Bjorn or not player right before I had played Master 2 had played Metamorph copying my One Ring. So now there's two One Rings going on, right? So Obnixilis wipes the board with Deluge, and then they follow up with Obnixilis. Very scary, right? Obviously we're a little we're a little nervous at that point. Tevesh Thrasios is by far the most effective by this. I only lost my commander. I'm not really worried about it. Uh, Bjorn or Wernog didn't really lose a ton. I believe they lost like a creature or two. I think it was Dranith, yeah. Um, but it wasn't anything. No, Dranth came later. They lost something. It was super inconsequential. Wasn't wasn't really worth worrying about. So Thrasios Devesh is pretty blown up by this Toxic Deluge. It goes to their turn. They play a land, and then they go to Imperial Seal, and Bjorn Ornog hits them with an Opposition Agent, right? So they are just seven years outside of this game. Uh, and Bjorn Ornog goes and grabs Minamo out of the Tevesh Thrasios' deck. Um, and... Yeah, that was very scary for us because, as I mentioned, they already had a metamorph copy of the One Ring. So here's this copy of the One Ring. They're able to then play it on their turn, uh, draw the cards off the One Ring, untap it, draw the cards again, right? So I had a One Ring that already had more counters on it, but it was very quickly uh, no longer me as a problem because they were just now drawing double the amount of cards every single turn, right? Then we enter this sort of stalemate <laughs> where I'm just holding up interaction because Bjorn Ornog is drawing a dumb amount of cards. I think at one point I play a Sylvan Library too, or I th think about doing it. I think I do play it. I don't think I draw much off of it, but I use it as like a Miri's Guile looking at the top three cards, right? So I'm like, yeah, I'm just going to hold up answers for Bjorn Ornog. Obnixilis is like, yeah, I'm I'm going to hit them in the face <laughs> uh, with Obnixilis, which is already, once again, getting a bunch of those triggers from the, the, um, the Roiling Vortex, which they've had since turn two. Uh, getting a bunch of cards there. They weren't really doing a ton with those cards, but they were just punching uh, Bjorn or Wernog in the face. Um, Devesh Thrasios is kind of just holding up interaction to try and not die. <laughs> uh, and it like, we do that for like two turns where it's just like Bjorn or Wernog goes for it. Uh, it's a whole thing. Eventually they have a hand of like 12 cards. They know they can't go for it because they just straight up draw only interaction at one point. Uh, they sculpt down their hand, pass back to me. Uh, I draw them a couple of cards at the time, too. I'm actually holding up my activation of drawing cards because I don't want to hurt myself in my turn. Don't want to get pinged by Ob Nixilis. We go to Ob, who has a lethal swing on Bjorn Wernog. So they have all this interaction, uh, send it into them. And I think Bjorn Wernog is going to draw like 13 cards on their turn with the One Ring stuff, um, which is obviously not good for us. <laughs> uh, so Ob's like, kill time. And uh, Bjorn Wernog channels Odawara, puts Ob back in their hand. Uh, and they also have a, I'll say this is when Bjorn Wernog plays the Dranith, um, which doesn't end up becoming a problem because for me, I, I do have pieces of food chain in my hand as I'm starting to draw much cards, but Bjorn Wernog's gotta die before it goes to me trying to win the game anyways, right? So like, I'm, I'm happy with them losing a bunch of life at some point, right? So we do a little bit of chip damage to them, even though Obnixilis doesn't make it through. Uh, Tevesh Thrasios, once again, just kind of plays a little bit of, uh, you know, hold up interaction as much as they can while also trying to like play a talisman here and there. Like they're, they're really, they were really put out by by the, uh, you know, the tutor getting sniped right after the board wipe, right? So they're they're doing their best. <laughs> they are they are trying their hardest. Um, and then Bjorn Warnock goes to their turn. Uh, they go down, I believe, from 10 life to four life due to the damage from the one ring. And in combination with their mana vault and the roiling vortex, right? So they've taken a chunk of damage. Um, and they go to draw their six cards. Now, at this point, right in the end step beforehand, I've drawn four cards and I have a Orcish Bowmasters, right? 
This is where things get a little messed up. So I'm down to like 19 life because I've also been one ringing. I have a civil library that I haven't really been triggering a bunch, um, but that's that's what I'm doing. Um, I might have been sandbagging the civil library. I don't remember. I know there was a civil library present. I don't remember if I actually ended up playing it. I know I definitely was losing a bunch of life to the one ring. I think I played it on like maybe the last rotation of the table, right? Like long when long past the point where that card was relevant and where Bjorn or Wernog was the problem always, right? So I'm like, okay, cool. You're gonna draw six. I'm gonna try and kill you, right? Uh, there's also like conversation about like, do I kill the Obnixilis and then like make it so they can't draw seven more cards? And I'm like, you know what? No, I'm not even gonna risk. Like, I'm just gonna kill Bjorn Wernog with the the one ring. So Bjorn Wernog at four life, hacked of negations. Now, for anyone who knows Roiling Vortex, the card we've been talking about all day, uh, there is a trigger with that card where whenever you go to cast a card that doesn't cost any mana, uh, you take five damage. Had we remembered that trigger, this would not have been even slightly an issue. But the awkwardness comes with, I respond with my own Pact of Negation. Uh, then Bjorn Wernog goes, okay, I'm gonna counter that. Uh, I'm gonna Tainted Pact, digging for an answer. While they are mid Tainted Pact, we realize that there are the Roiling Vortex triggers in the stack. So, if Bjorn Wernog decides to just die, as is, like if they go, oh right, Tainted Pact, I'm not gonna cast anything, I'm gonna take my five and die. Then I'm stuck taking five. I still have a Pact trigger to pay because of the way the stack works. <laughs> Call a judge over and they basically say like, yeah, you don't actually have to announce the trigger until the stack clears down to the point. So really tough to hear at the point because literally at that point I have to pay for Pact. I take five damage for literally no value because of a play that never needed to happen. Luckily the Bjorn Wernock player was like by keeping you alive right now, I could potentially be extending the game and therefore be pushing towards a draw, even though I die. Because if, if you're dead in a pod and it still goes to a draw, uh, it allows, basically it, it, it everyone gets a point even if they actually die during the course of the game, right? So they hit my pact with an offer you can't refuse after grabbing it off the tainted pact, right? Which was, as I said, move they definitely didn't have to do, but they said, you know, they found a strategic advantage in it. But anyways, that gets countered. I still take the five damage. Uh, we get back to my turn. I have to dig through the one ring and we get to the point where I fight off another piece of interaction as I go for it, right? But like Ob and, and Tevesh Thrasios were, were pretty low and stuff. Um, and I have like almost exactly enough mana with uh, a little bit left over to be able to, um, and, and the, the mana from it being an offer you can't refuse countering my pack doesn't really matter. Um, but I do have exactly enough mana to be able to grab food chain, exile a portion of my deck until I hit my enabler uh, and play the food chain. Go for my commander for infinite damage, um, or infinite rad counters, I should say. Uh, pass the turn and neither of my opponents have any responses, they die, and that is my second win of the day. I'm at the bottom of the people who can draw in, right? So my breakers are the worst of the 10 point people, the two win people, right? So I'm like, I don't know if I can actually afford to draw because there's a chance I draw twice. And if everybody draws, I get bumped out because it's 120 players. It's weird like that happens. So we sit down for round four and I'm like, hey guys, I'm, I'm sorry to say this. I know we all have two wins, but I think I have to play this out because there is a very solid chance if we just draw twice, I do not get there. Um, and all my puns were super chill about that. Like, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, right? Like the, the, the draw is the thing that is like the luxury, uh, but you know, they were super chill about that. Um, so we play this crazy game with Magda in first seat, myself in second seat, Narset in third seat, and Jensen with Loris as a companion in fourth seat. So the game starts off kind of crazy. I, I lead with the fish, right? Uh, Magda just plays a dwarf, passes to me. Narset on turn one plays a Burning Inquiry, which makes Magda, you know, we, we all discard a couple nice things here and there. Um, Magda discards Clock of Omens and Dockside. So they get sort of put back real quick, right? Uh, which is huge because that's the reason Magda isn't able to just like snap win this game during multiple points of this game, right? 
The Jensen Lotus player just grabs a couple value things. Like it's, it's nothing crazy either way, right? So we all go around the table. Magda starts playing a lot of value really, really quickly. They're getting in their attacks. Um, everyone's being really good at the table about like blocking as many Magda things as we can. Cause once again, they're very clearly taking over the lead really quick. Um, they first activation, we know they can't go for clock moments to win, but they do grab a God Pharaoh statue. And all of us are like, oh F, like all of our game plans are kind of shut off right now, right? So we start trying to slog through this God Pharaoh statue. Turn after turn of just like Magda playing more stacks pieces. Uh, unlicensed Hearths gets played and all three of our decks that are facing against Magda care about the graveyard, right? Like I've had a reanimate in hand uh, as as soon as this unlicensed Hearths comes out and I'm like, oh, I've been trying to like wait for the right time to like reanimate this dock side in Magda's graveyard and then I get absolutely hosed by the unlicensed hearse, and I'm like, oh crud. Uh, once again, I, I'm casually milling myself a little bit with some effects I play. I think I play my commander at some point. I flip into like Razgath in my graveyard. They snipe it out of there with the uh, with the unlicensed hearse. Narset is just doing like really not a lot because they're trying to develop engines. Um, Jensen Luris is playing a bunch of mana, and we've got this like showdown that's happening where all of us are kind of holding up interaction because we don't want to tap out into Magda. But Magda is also just like playing value engine, playing value engine, playing value engine over and over and over again. At one point, I have an opposition agent, which stops them from winning for a really long time. Then there gets to a point where Jensen Luris copies my opposition agent just to make sure that Magda can't go for it. And then we start getting to a point where we are getting desperate. And I've like held up mana turn after turn after turn. I've got a Cyclonic Rift and Jensen Luris is like, I dude, I can't let you resolve an overloaded Cyclonic Rift. I'm like, I can't even cast it fully overloaded into the God Pharaoh statue. So much going on. And at one point, because I saw Magda's hand with Opposition Agent, I knew they had a Pyroblast, right? So at any point I could have gone, because I had in my hand Painted Pact and Thassa's Oracle, right? So knowing that Magda had Pyroblast, I was not going to go for the end step line where I exile my entire library and then leave one card left and then play Thassa's Oracle on my turn because I knew it's just going to get Pyroblasted, right? So this whole time I'm waiting for Magda to use the Pyroblast and they've been so patient with it. They're not using it at all, no matter how many things get thrown at them. They're waiting for like the right stuff and, and they're doing a really good job of it. Narset gets Grand Abolisher at one point, that kind of becomes a problem. Magda's forced to use Galvanic Blast on it instead of on the Opposition Agent because we're like going to lose to Narset on their turn because they have Narset plus Grand Abolisher. These things get crazy. Like truly, the game is so much back and forth, but still just being a giant stalemate the whole time. I can't stress enough. I did like three or four turns in a row where I just held up Oppo and, and Cyclonic Rift and Tainted Pact and just like passed turn after turn after turn after turn, occasionally playing like a soul ring for three mana or whatever, like just not doing anything that was actually changing the game, apart from playing this opposition agent, which warped the game extremely, right? And Mag just playing engine, engine, engine. They've got a uh a uh, Portal to Phyrexia in their hand too, which we know as soon as they hit nine treasures, that's going to come down to be a problem, which I feel like could have happened earlier and blown us out a little bit, but specifically because one of the opposition agents wasn't an imposter mech, that, that was a whole thing. Either way, not really relevant, uh, but there's a lot of slog back and forth, and eventually I get to the point where I'm like, hey dude, I'm, I'm Jensen player, I'm trying to single target Psych Rift, targeting this God Pharaoh statue. You've had so much mana open, like I know you got something, let's make this game happen, because if not, Magda's just going to slowly grind us out, right? And they were like, dude, I can't play ball. Uh, I I think, like, there, you have a solid chance of winning if you just pop this statue and go for it on your turn. I'm like, yeah, I mean, I'm going to try and win, but, like, also, like, uh, I'm not just going to jam it. And then, like, you know, there's there's a lot of, like, cards in hand, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I was like, okay, I'm just going to keep passing the turn. And then it gets to the point where Magda starts to get really out of hand and I sort of have to tap out for a Phyrexian Metamorph, copying one of Magda's value creatures. And then last turn of the game, Magda is able to, uh, finally remove my opposition agent. I'm kind of tapped out of interaction because we're at the point where, as I said, I, I couldn't bounce the God Pharaohs and no one wanted to like work with me at the end. They were, they were doing a really good job of doing it for most of the game. Uh, but everyone was so afraid of one person winning that they were just kind of letting Magda slowly win. Um, but in the last turn, Magda gets to the point where they have Magda, they have vehicles to tap all of their dwarves, they have a bunch of stuff where basically they have like 10 treasures and the ability to like play Roaming Throne and a couple other things, make copies of Roaming Throne so that every time they're playing a dwarf, uh, and then Masquid next comes out. So they're basically able to tutor every single creature out of their deck 
this is turn zero also. So we hit turns. They're able to tutor every single creature out of their deck, a significant amount of the artifacts of their deck, but they are unable to net enough mana to do all of that, crack an Elixir of Immortality, shuffle back in the Clock of Omens, and then activate Magda again. They're like three mana short. It, it, it like crazy end state of the board. So on that last turn, they're able to basically say like, I'm able to respond to a decent amount of stuff. I'm able to win next turn as soon as it get back to me, but I can't win this turn, right? So that happens at the end of turn zero. And so it ends up being a draw, which is rather anticlimactic after that, right? Like it ends up just being this giant slog of a game and we draw anyways, right? I'm in 13th position, I believe, or, or 10th position, something like that. Um, with 11 points, I sit down with my last round pod and we're like, we're, we all kind of want to draw here. I, I'm, I've moved it up, up enough with my breakers to know that if I draw, I'm very confident that I'll be able to make the top 16. So we just do an intentional draw in the last round of Swiss. Could be a lot worse, could be a lot better. Uh, I end up in 13th place going into it, so I'm in the third pod in fourth seat. The top 16 was Blue Farm in seat one, uh, Urza in seat two, and Urabrask, <laughs> the uh, the newest one, the Flipper Urabrask in seat three. Super sick deck. Blue Farm starts very early, does a really good job playing a bunch of value engines. Very scary, right? Um, Urza plays a bunch of mana, doesn't go like super insane, but like does the thing. Um, I start with an early spell seeker where I grab demonic consultation, right? So I'm I'm kind of basically saying to the table, like, you know, I'm not going for it per se, right? But I'm like, at any point where someone messes up, I'm gonna eventually push, right? Um at the end step, I think before my second turn. As I mentioned, Blue Farm just playing value engines, Urza playing a bunch of mana. Uh, I think they get a recurring insight off on turn two or turn three. So it was like super early in the game. Um, but Blue Farm's accruing a ton of value, right? Uh, Urbrask is sort of like playing some stuff, not going too crazy into it, but definitely like starting to, to get some things going, right? Uh, I jam the demonic consultation. No one responds to that because like it's not my win con, right? Uh, I consult super deep. Like, I think I get like 27 cards left in my library by the time I find Food Chain, which, you know, I had Miss Holographin exiled, which it was like one of the last cards exiled too, right? So like, I still had Eternal Scourge somewhere in the 27 cards that was my deck, um, which is insane, truly, <laughs> like truly insane. Uh, and so we get to the point where I have 27 cards left. I have Miss Hollow, I have Food Chain. I know for sure I'm not winning the game. I just pass the turn, right? I'm gonna play responsibly at this point. I did the thing, I'm not going for it, right? Um, Blue Farm is is playing Dockside, is playing a bunch of value engines, is looking at our graveyards for Mnemonic Betrayal, is doing a bunch of stuff, right? Like getting very, very scary. Um, Urza untaps and gets to the point where they are going for the win. Now, Blue Farm's also been chipped down a couple times at this point. Um, we go around the table one more time. Urza's like clearly starting to assemble an Isochron Scepter thing, although they don't like have it, have it, but like they're starting to do something. Um, Urubrask plays a few spells, chipping away at Blue Farm's life, and then gets to the point where they flip Urubrask. In the first mode is three damage to a player in each creature they control, right? So they flip it and wipe Blue Farm's board entirely, which if they didn't do that, Blue Farm probably just wins that game, period, right? There is also a Winter Orb on the battlefield that Urza played pretty early on, which is stopping Blue Farm from just destroying us, right? Um, I am at a point where like I have a Wild Growth land and a Mox Diamond, so I literally only had one land for the whole game, and luckily I'm still able to like do a couple things here and there throughout the game, get a little bit of card advantage, all that kind of stuff. I don't think I'm, I don't have like a One Ring or anything like that. I'm just sort of like holding up my my Spellseeker or Food Chain stuff, like ready to like pop off at any point, right? Um, the game gets super sloggy at this point. Uh, Blue Farm gets wiped, but then comes back to me. I don't really do much. I just pass the turn. I think I play my commander. Um, and then we get to Blue Farm. They untap the lands. They're holding up a direction. Urza goes for the Isochron Scepter win, right? And we're all tapped pretty low. I don't think I have anything at this point for this. I don't remember why. I think I was just like out of stuff to do, right? Um, but I don't have any answer for Isochron Scepter. Uh, obviously, Mono Red doesn't have any answers for Isochron Scepter, and 
we they start like putting scepter together they tutor for the scepter piece they play the scepter activate one time untap their stuff and they activate a second time and everyone's like oh are we just like dead here and blue farm's like well uh, they, they have seven cards in hand and they're like well yeah i think we're just dead and i was like well you have seven cards in hand do you not really have anything and they show us a mind break trap and they're like well i only have this and we're like okay we'll counter the ice crown scepter activation on the stack they don't have and they, they have no other way of untapping it right um which they do so as uh, my break trap targets the ice crown scepter um Blue Farm has uh, no mana left. They can't fight anymore, right? Urza has 10 mana floating. <laughs> so they have or like five mana floating and then five mana with their permanence, right? So they flip with Urza. They whiff on it. We're like, oh, thank goodness. It's going to get countered. They're like, no, no, no. I have enough for another Urza activation, right? And meanwhile, for those who don't know, Urza activations are literally you shuffle your library, flip the top card, then you can cast for free, right? So they're literally digging for counter spells in these top five, right? The second of those cards that get flipped over is an offer you can't refuse, which then counters the mind break trap. But with the dramatic reversal still in the stack, Blue Farm had showed us their hand and they had Adnaws in hand. So the offer you can't refuse gave them enough treasures where Blue Farm is able to Adnaws in response to this, this thing to get a free counter spell to stop us losing the game. They do they hit the adnaws they get a bunch of cards down they go to 10 life and at that point they hit a force of negation the force of negation counters the isochron scepter uh and that stops but blue farm's now at 10 and urza has a construct and one other creature on the battlefield and goes well you stop my win swing kill blue farm blue farm's out of the game we get to uh, Urbrask. Urbrask is so none of us have any mana untapped, right? We're, we're, we're dead on board. Urbrask, they have a Karn's Bastion. So they use that to proliferate the Urbrask. So they make the three treasures and then it goes to the last mode, which is basically like a mnemonic betrayal combined with the past in flames. You can cast spells from everybody's graveyards. This is the sorcerers only, but like the thing is, you don't mana fix, which is, is kind of the problem with the card. Uh, they go on a storm turn for probably 10 minutes. They're ripping a bunch of cards, doing a bunch of crazy stuff. But the thing is, they can't cast a bunch of the cards in our decks. And I think the one area they messed up was they tried to transmute artifact for more fast mana, but ended up doing it in a way where they actually just lost mana and lost colored mana specifically. So I think that was sort of the point where they, they had lost it there because they could have used my demonic consultation in graveyard to go dig for something. Um, it would have there was a chance they exiled their entire library, right? But they, they had a chance to do something there. Um, but they go through this 15, 20 minute storm turn. Um, and at the end of it, they don't have enough pieces and they fizzle, uh, flip back over to normal or Urbrask. Can't really do the thing, right? Um, then it gets passed to me. And at this point, Urbrask is stormed off. They don't have any cards in hand. Urza's tapped out because they fought over their Ice Crown Scepter. And I'm just like, OK, well, you guys know I have this food chain in hand. Uh, and everyone's like, yeah, for sure. So I put infinite rad counters on everybody. But I also remember Urza can untap <laughs> and has Isochron Scepter combo. Um, and at one point I had actually played Raul, uh, one of the cards we talked about earlier, the Troubleshooter. And uh, I'd been milling a couple cards and I milled that turn and I was able to get Talion and use some of the infinite food chain mana to cast Talion out of my graveyard and put it on two so that when Urza win on their turn, if they went to do the Isochron Scepter loop, I would be drawing cards and they would be taking two damage for every time they went through that. So they wouldn't be able to win uh, through Talion, even though they could present infinite mana in response to uh, the rad counters on their turn. So luckily I found that Talion and I was able to put them in a lock. Everyone else went to their turn, died to the radiation counters, passed it to me, and I got that game. That's the semifinals. Before we get into the finals and break down the finals of this tournament, I want to remind you that we do coaching here over at Comedian MTG. So if you're interested in CEDH coaching at all, if you have any tournaments coming up, or if you're just trying to get into the format, feel free to reach out to me at any number of the places that are going to be linked down in the description, which would be my email at ComedianMTG at gmail.com, Twitter at ComedianMTG, or Comedian underscore MTG on Discord. Feel free to message me at any of those places if you're interested in finding out more about rates and coaching types. We have gameplay coaching, we have one-on-one -on -one coaching we do video reviews a bunch of different stuff like that all to help you take that next step in your game 
I'm currently, you know, one of the players with the most wins of any CDH player ever, and uh, definitely have more wins than any other player with different strategies, different decks, and things like that. So if you're interested in taking that next level up in your game, feel free to inquire about more. All right, the finals of this CEDH tournament. So going into the finals, uh, we had a weird pod, you know. So in first spot is Xur, uh, which, you know, definitely a deck that it has been showing up a little bit more lately. But Xur is definitely still a, uh, a deck that's often considered a relic of the past. Then we have in second a Thrasios Akiri build, which uh, definitely was a quirky Thrasios Akiri build. The deck list isn't online, but it, uh, you know, definitely some inclusions in there that I are not what I would typically associate with Thrasios Akiri. We had Sisse in third, and then we have myself in fourth position. So the the pod starts out pretty interestingly uh i'm i'm going and trying to do the same nonsense that i've been doing all day which is i'm trying to do that turn two spell seeker uh and demonic consultation right away to be able to go down and get my food chain and then hopefully someone slips up and i can go for my win right the second turn of the game the thrasio Sakiri player plays a trinisphere uh and this is where the game sort of gets a little bit wild um I will say in general, uh, my my opponents in this game were definitely like keeping it light, very, very goofy, um, but almost to a point where it was like definitely taking precedence over what was actually happening in the game, which was not something I'm used to. Like I'm, I'm usually a player who like cracks a lot of jokes at the table and definitely keeps things pretty light. Uh, but this was like to a point where it was like a little excessive to the point where I think like people were making plays and like sort of like indicating that they were like, oh, well, this is funny, so I'm going to do this, um, which was definitely not something I was expecting from a finals pod. Um, so it was definitely a little bit disappointing, like getting all the way to the finals match and then like having the conduct in that pod be a little bit, you know, not what was expected. Um, that being said, it was definitely so. So this pod's going on. Uh, the Trinisphere comes out of Thrasio Sakiri and one of the first things I said was, oh, so Sisse is in a really good spot, right? Like it's to the point where I have considered playing Trinisphere in Sisse because of how well that deck operates under a Trinisphere, um, which is really not great. Uh, and then Sisse proceeds to follow up that Trinisphere with a Derevi, which is kind of like the nightmare scenario uh, to be under a Derevi Trinisphere. Um, Sissy starts attacking, untap into permanence. Uh, they then get a Fabro Elder down. So we're in a really tough spot. Um, and I'm basically in a position where I have to hold up my mana at all times because, uh, you know, if I want to go for the consult line, I have to do that at end step. And if I want to be able to interact with anything on the stack, I have to do that too. Um, and we get to a point where all I have is consult and I can't two spell, right? So I cannot cast consultation and then get another spell off of it uh, to interact with anything. We go to Xur's turn. They, at one point, Toxic Deluge to uh, only wipe. This is actually before the Trinisphere. Before the Trinisphere, they, they go to Toxic Deluge because they have Lavinia and I have Spellseeker and a Mana Dork. And the other players don't have any other creatures either. Um, I hit that with a miscast. That sort of resolves. That's This is the turn cycle of the Trinisphere. Um, then, yeah, when it gets back to me after the Derevi, I still have to pass with the consult up because I don't have any other interaction, uh, and we're sort of in a tough spot because the Trinisphere, right, I, I can't really tap out for anything, uh, and hold up any sort of interaction, right? So, we get to Xur's turn. Xur plays a bunch of mana, and then passes. Then we get to Thrasio Sakiri, and Thrasio Sakiri fully taps out, <laughs> uh, into the void of, of mana there and they they tap seven mana to try and cast an invasion of Ikoria x equals five meanwhile we had been having conversations at the table where it's like okay all sisse needs to do to win is play a red mana source they have fabro elder they have derevi they have sisse those of us that know the deck know that that is a definitive win right as soon as they untap and activate sisse they win the game right so the invasion of Ikoria happens X equals five. Xur is forced to answer it because I don't have anything I can do to answer it at the time either. Um, and so Xur mana drains it, which then completely taps them out because they only have five mana. So they use three of their five mana to answer and therefore the Trinisphere is out and makes everything cost three, right? So Xur is tapped out. Uh, the specifically Invasion of Ikoria 
meant so that Grassio Sakiri only has two mana up, and all I have up is the Demonic Constitution. So we get to the point where we go to Sisei's turn. Uh, they draw a Mox Diamond as their land for turn. They pay three mana into it. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Play the Mox Diamond for three. That's the red source. They activate Sisei once. Uh, and they start to win the game. Now, the turn prior, I had played Mind Crank um, as one of my one as one of my plays uh, because I was trying to have my commander out and get a bit of value. So, so my commander was out at the time. Um, there had definitely been some turns in between that it was just like sort of this the stalling, waiting for Sisei to win, basically. <laughs> um, so I had Mind Crank out, and we get to the point where Sisei proposes a loop uh, where they say like I'm going to start Mount Dooming everybody, right? Uh, and I remind them that I have Mind Crank out, so. In the first two iterations of Mount Doom damaged everybody, uh, there's a Mind Crank trigger that flips over Athassa's Oracle uh, from the Zur deck. So I use the Master's ability to reanimate the Thassa's Oracle. It puts the ETB in the stack. I cast a Demonic Consultation. Sisei floats more mana in response to the win and uh, tutors up Urtai to stop me from, from trying to steal the win right there, and then proceeds to continue at instant speed, uh, killing us. So despite, you know, uh, my best efforts there, we were definitely pretty dead from that point in the game. Um, and yeah, it was it was definitely a game where being fourth uh, behind a bit of stacks and, and stacks that really favor Sisse, it was really hard to do much of anything in that game. Um, I wasn't really sure what the Thrasio Sekiri deck does to like sort of break parity on on the Trinisphere. So that was kind of interesting. Um, I'm definitely curious to hear more about like why that inclusion was there in that deck and, and definitely like really heavily pushed things in Sisei's favor basically as soon as that card resolved because Zur was just 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 doing its best <laughs> the whole time not really producing a lot they, they played Lavinia pretty early they thought Lavinia was gonna help support my win uh, it didn't do that and then um, basically Trinisphere into uh, Sisei finding that red source of mana made sure that the game didn't happen so Despite a really, uh, you know, engaging and interesting like series of games throughout this tournament, the finals match was like almost somewhat anticlimactic because it was just a case of like Trinisphere backfired pretty hard. It protected Sisei for the win and then we lost to Sisei. So, uh, you know, that happens sometimes. Definitely part of the game and uh, not much you can really do about it. But at the end of the day, uh, happy to take this Fallout Commander that um, you know is definitely definitely one of the spicier lists I brought to a tournament recently, um, and uh, take it the week of its release and bring it to a top four of a of a large 122 person CDH tournament. So at the end of the day, I uh, can't really be sad about the uh, the results of making top four with this brand new deck. Um, it was definitely very fun to pilot. As I mentioned, sort of had a bit of those problems that we mentioned that like a lot of the spice cards I did not <laughs> see throughout the day. Um, you know, I occasionally saw my reanimates and saw a bunch of stuff like that, but those were the games that I didn't have any of my self mill. And then there were games where I, you know, had a bunch of self mill, but didn't have any of my reanimation. I didn't have the ability to play on my commander. So that part was a little bit awkward. And I feel like that's just sort of a problem with reanimation in CEDH in general. Like a lot of the time you need the A plus B and you need it to be at a succinct time. You need protection for the A plus B as well. And it's not like an A plus B that instantly just like wins the game like a Dockside Sabertooth or a Dockside Emil, right? So reanimation's a little funky that way. There's definitely like a decent amount of stuff you can do with it. Um, I still had a ton of fun with this commander. I'm I'm kind of wondering where this leaves Sultai in the food chain department. Like, is Kazurukima better than this commander? Is this commander's ability to grind more interesting, more powerful? It's really hard to say. Um, I definitely want to play more games with it before like making any sort of hard declaration either way. But um, at the end of the day, yeah, suits. Very proud of my performance to be able to to be able to get through um, with this very quirky new Fallout commander. So. Thanks everybody for watching. I uh, hope you enjoy videos like this. Make sure to hit that like button, subscribe button, and leave a comment down below. If you have any thoughts about the deck, any thoughts about the tournament itself, definitely feel free to leave them in the comments down below. Thank you all so much for watching. And if you're interested in supporting extra, check out patreon.com slash comedianmtg where every bit helps. As I mentioned, gonna do a deep dive in there soon, uh, as soon as we stop traveling every three days. <laughs> but uh, yeah, everybody, I'll, I'll catch you all later. Thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you next time. Peace. Afraid to turn out the lights in